to Montessori for Everybody TV. I'm Susan Zink and I'm going to talk about one of the areas of the Montessori classroom that I love the most, the zoology area. It is probably one of the places where I have learned a lot about managing a classroom and uh, some bad habits that perhaps I can keep you from having as well as some habits to keep organized a part of the classroom that can have a lot of moving parts. So what I'm going to do in this segment is I'm going to talk about how I have organized my Montessori zoology materials so that I can rotate them through the classroom for three complete levels and have that be done in a reasonable way that also really supports making those materials help the children get drawn in to the subject, get drawn into the deeper learning in the zoology um, part of the classroom, as well as the language parts and other things that I'll refer to as we talk about some of these materials that could be used in different places. So we're going to start with the, the bits that a lot of you probably have been able to purchase from um, online retailers, possibly at big box craft stores in the United States with some 40% off coupons. And how do you use those to best effect? So the first thing that I want to say is it's not going to be perfect when you start. And please give yourself permission to to just be okay with that. Um, everything that you do, everything you put your heart into preparing for those children is going to give benefit. And some of it's going to do more and some of it's going to do less. And you need to just accept this is going to be an ongoing process. And one thing I'm going to say is please, please, please have your refinements, have the ways that you make your classroom better be based on your observations of the children. It's okay if they're based on your own aesthetic because you have a well-developed art aesthetic perhaps, but don't let that run the show. Make sure you're making your improvements based on what draw the children into the work and into concentrated attention that will help them develop their personalities. So what I'm holding in my hand are some rejects. <laughs> when I started my Montessori school back in the 1980s, uh, models of animals that were inexpensive tended to look more like this sort of bright yellow giraffe here. Definitely no need to see it up close. You get a good sense of it from there. This kind of cartoonish um, ostrich fellow, which are maybe a cross between an ostrich and a flamingo. So I think I'm making my point that they're not particularly authentic. Now, this giraffe is not bad. You know, you would definitely recognize it. It's a very easy to recognize animal. But if you have lower level quality um, animals like this, maybe use them in your language area. So giraffe is a soft G sound. So that would be good to have in a soft G exercise in your language area. Obviously, zebra is one of those few animals that has the beginning Z sound, so that would be um, a good use of it. If it really is impossible to tell for sure what the animal is supposed to be, I would just put it maybe in the sandbox or something like that. Now, I said that I was going to talk about moving and making things better and better. So what I'd like to do is show you kind of some of my beginning zoology slash language work from my classroom back maybe circa 1983, 84, something like that. Now, before I do that, I'm going to tell you what I did <laughs> right before we started filming because I have been in the process of a move. So I had my sweet husband get my animals squared away so that I could show you this next piece. And I, I, I kind of am wanting to help you see how I'm organizing these things in the process. So this is the Kleenex box that I cut apart last night to be able to drop some of my rejects into because I had run out of things to organize, little food containers, things like that. And I had here go through some of my rejects to fill in some of the places in my tins. And you'll see in a moment why they're called animal tins. So this was sort of part of my um, 
reading, but it was in the zoology area because it's all animals. And the quality of the, the models definitely uh, varies um, from something like this to a uh, gorilla that, that looks pretty sad. Um, and there are a few missing, probably because they got taken out to put in a language area. But what you can see is all I did was cut circles. I had a circle cut. Nope, I didn't. I traced circles, cut them out with, with um, scissors, and then I put them in muffin tins. And once I had them set up like that, I would put them out one at a time, and then eventually the children, when they were reading well enough and knew all of the animals, so this is this is kind of like a visual version of a of a what am I exercise or the animal stories exercise. After they had all that they um, uh, and once they'd learned them ten by ten, then I put out all of the tens, and they would mix up all 36 of the animals and see if they could put them back. Now, the reason that I still have this is because I've been upgrading. I've, I've got other things going on and it was like, oh, well, I'll get to that, see which one of those I need. And you can see I've pulled a few out. But this is where I started. And that's just fine. This was one of the most popular materials in my classroom. So please don't feel like you have to have everything perfect and buy things that are out of your budget when you start. So now I'd like to talk about how to organize things, especially if you have a lot of different animal things in a lot of different places. The way that I've organized the zoology curriculum is in thinking about it in three different ways. Two of them that are probably pretty familiar to you are organizing the animals by continents. Um, you can find sets um, that are sold that are pretty much for a continent. Um, animals of uh, Australia, that's a, a pretty common little set. If you buy cards at the um, dollar stores or the dollar aisles of some of the big box stores in the, the U.S., you will, will find that, that some of those animals will be represented, though likely not all of them. And you also, of course, can collect them. So one way to organize the animals is by the continent on which they live. I find this is most useful for those very distinct kind of animals. The, there are certainly animals that are only native to Australia. The only place that, that you're likely to see them um, outside of Australia is in a preserve or, or, or a zoo. The same is true for um, parts of uh, South America, the Galapagos Islands, if you're studying, if you put those in your study of South America. And if you are in North America, U.S., Canada, you will want a good collection of the animals of uh, your, the continent on which the children live. If you're in Europe, same thing there. So, so you're going to want to have some of those grouped by which animals are in your children's uh, own continent as well as, as d being distinctive. Africa, of course, has some animals that are very distinctive uh, to it. So that's one way to organize them, and it's pretty easy to, to do that for the most part. The second way that you're probably um, pretty familiar with, and, and there's not a lot of explanation that's needed if you understand biomes, is organizing them by biomes. Now, this is a little bit trickier. Um, you will find that there are collections of, of animals by biomes. I'm going to pull a another little set out here and I've got um, some of the animals from the desert biome and again this was a one of the little tube sets from from safari so the, the anteater the the horned lizard a, a scorpion a road runner also a little bit of plant life in there cigarro and and so that is a way that you can start this is one that I need to flesh out. There are certainly more little animal models that I have that are desert dwellers. And deserts are one of the simplified biome sets that, that I use. So I will look for things to add into here. Definitely going to want to add in some arthropods, some insects, some things like that. Now, this is um, an example of 
the way that I store them, just in a, a plastic bag. This is the Africa set that I have. I do include things like the um, uh, penguins that, that live on the continent of Africa, so it's not just a stereotypical understanding of the animals that live in that location. Now, before I move on from biomes, I am going to mention kind of a way, two ways to approach that. One is if you have biome sets, if you've purchased some pre made biome materials, Washika makes some beautiful things. Uh, Washika Biomes, I think, may even be their, their website, and, and I would certainly encourage you to look there for, for some of the, the things that they have. I, as you know, am very big on cutting up books, and so one of the ways that I defined which animals I was going to place in different biomes was based on a book that I cut up. Beautiful book. It's not a realistic book in this, the sense that if you look at this photo of a desert and you don't, with the glare, I don't know if you'll be able to see it very closely, but obviously all these animals are not going to be out at the same time, but it, it's a good representation. These are truly animals of a desert that would be in the same desert space. And here is a, a wetlands, river, kind of a biome, same thing. So what I did is I used the, the boards, the biome boards that I made as the basis for the animals that I was going to place in those biomes to begin with, so that I can have a set of biome animals, a set of continent animals, and then the classification that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, when I do the biomes, I believe we need to go in great depth, especially by the time you're at the upper elementary level, but in the process, on, on the way before you're, you're at that place, I think you need to keep it a little bit simple. And so what I have done is I've kind of simplified the biomes down into six sets. The forest, which would be studying separately but in the same time frame, temperate forests, boreal forests, the, the rainforest, um, desert, so forest, desert, wetlands, which includes river um, uh, biomes as well, tundra and other cold biomes that are not desert biomes, um, ocean, and mountains and grasslands. Now, I don't believe that you should completely conflate those when you're working with them with the children, but particularly when you're working at the three to six level, that gives you a way to rotate through where you could study two of those biome groups in depth every year of the three-year cycle. And you could then repeat that in upper elementary. So you've got that deliberate spiral effect that's going on. Now, the last thing that I'm going to mention before I go on to the classification piece is, so then, how do you organize all your stuff? <laughs> so I've got a little stack here, um, and this is kind of to introduce that last piece. Besides sorting your materials by continent, biomes or habitats, and, and, and biomes and habitats, the other way is by classification. You are going to want to study mammals in depth. You're going to want to study reptiles in depth. You're certainly going to want to study arthropods and particularly insects in depth. And you can do that in the context of the, the um, geographical regions, both by habitat and by, by continent location, but that's not the best way to, I, I, I don't believe you can get the depth that you need if you're staying only there. So when I sort my materials, all of the things for an in-depth study of the mammals are going to be together. Um, very nice book that I got for 50 cents at the discount store. These are more of the cards. Now one of the reasons that I'm showing you the mammals example is because if you're purchasing cards from the dollar store, most of the animals in there, unless you're specifically buying sea creatures or something like that, are probably going to be mammals. Now there will be a few other examples, typically, and I found that can be good in a mammal set because this, in this set, everything in here 
is a mammal except for these cards. So we've got an amphibian, we've got a few reptiles, and we've got a few birds. So those can be in there as a not mammal vertebrate. That would be a, a, a very reasonable thing to study there. Now the last piece that I want to talk about in terms of that way of thinking about the creatures is when you're going to go in depth with mammals, you're going to want cards, models, that are just the mammals. But that's not where you're going to want to start. Where you're going to want to start is the whole animal kingdom. So you're going to want to have collections for sorting by phyla, class, order, those big general um, uh, levels of the classification. You also are going to want to teach a branching model of classification along with those. Reptiles are reptiles, but they don't belong in a little box separate from birds and dinosaurs anymore. They, you need to be teaching that connection. And speaking of dinosaurs, I believe that one of the things you should scan your collection of models for is introducing them on the timeline of life. Sponges have been around a really long time, and you can tell this is a real sponge um, remains of a dead sponge. I'm not sure how else to call that. And anytime you can do that, I encourage you to do it. If you don't have a real fossil of a prehistoric frog, then by all, by all means buy the little plastic models. That's very, very appropriate. But if you don't have a real trilobite, I'd suggest you're not looking very hard because you've, you've got a plastic model here, but this is an actual trilobite. This is an actual fossil. The, the creature that lived millions of years ago is, is sitting on my hand. Uh, the, the, where it sat is sitting on my hand, and that's part of the magic. That's part of what these kinds of materials can do to get the children excited. So I encourage you, as you organize your materials, to think about what is going to make the best use of them. And if, as I did when you were going through your zoology boxes, you find something that you stuck in because that was the last box that you packed in your classroom and you realized that you hadn't taken the cards off of the art shelf yet, it's okay you will get better and better at organizing things. You'll get better and better at choosing the best way to use the materials to spark that interest that sets those children off on research that takes them hours and days. But on the way, be gentle with yourself and use your observations for the basis of your refinements in your classroom. In previous segments, you may have heard me talk about practical life exercises and the need to have them have practical applications. That is definitely a principle that I think is very important and one that I see not always being implemented to the degree that I think it should be in Montessori schools. However, there is the idea that practical life exercises are also for improving the development of the muscles, particularly manual development, improving the uh, pincher grasp, the, just the ability for a child to use their fingers in a, a very precise way for preparation for, for writing, for holding the pencil, um, using the metal or geometric metal insets in order to, to trace the, the shapes is one of the ways that we prepare the hand for writing as well as using the knobs on the knob cylinders. But there are definitely ways that we can have practical life exercises do that same thing. I would encourage you, again, to look for ways that this can either be a complete exercise or be um, something that is, is enriching on several levels to the child. One of the reasons that I believe, um, and actually have had some teachers confess is the reason that some of their practical life things are the way that they are, is that a lot of preparatory practical life exercises aren't very messy. It's pretty easy to maintain them. You don't have to change a lot of things out. I, I understand that, but that should not be what manages what goes on your shelves in the practical life area. 
So if we're talking about manual development, what are some things that we can do? If we're talking about physical development, if we're talking about making sure that any of the things we can do to help that child's physiology connect with their neurology and have all those messages go where they need to go, what are some possibilities? Well, let's talk about some, some different things and some different materials we can use in that regard. Now, you may be familiar, probably are in my experience, with these little um, beads. They're little plastic cylinder beads. They are sold under different names. Perler is one of the brand names I've seen. Um, I'm assuming Pisla is the, the way that this from the IKEA company is pronounced. But what is what the way that they're used is that the small beads are picked up either with fingers or a tweezer is, is the appropriate and then placed on these little forms. They can be uh, placed on the form in just a kind of a, a set arrangement. The heart that you see can just be filled in randomly or there can be layers and, and uh, uh, a real pattern arrangement to the way that the beads are set up and then optionally doesn't have to happen but the, the designs can be made permanent and, and be fused with an iron. Um, I have found baking parchment to be one of the ideal ways to uh, to protect the, the iron from the plastic beads and the plastic beads being melted into uh, uh, the iron one of the things that I would suggest is that if you decide to have this in your classroom, that having the designs fused be an occasional situation. So the process is the main thing. What's the developmental benefit there? Definitely some incredibly careful pincher grasp either with the fingers or with the tweezer is needed, especially if the child decides to refine their design after they have several beads set down, it can be very, very challenging. And that's not the only benefit. The design, the idea of teaching pattern, teaching which colors look good together, uh, using things that they've learned from other aspects of the curriculum, such as complementary colors to make a strong contrast, uh, colors near one another on the color wheel to make a more subtle design, cool colors for a cool feel. You can see the, the possibilities there. So that's one of the ways that we can have an exercise. It could be on the, in the art area, it can be in the practical life area, uh, but it definitely will help with manual development. Now, any time that you're dealing with closures for the close, this is helping with manual development as well as independence. I'm going to suggest that one of the ways you can take things up a notch, because this episode is kind of about including things you may not already be doing in your classroom, is if you have the tying frame in the classroom and the child uh, that, that you're looking to challenge is successful with the tying frame, successful with tying his or her own shoes, uh, maybe successful in tying aprons on their classmates, then the next challenge is tying an apron on yourself. So the child would put the apron on and have to put the tie behind and tie it on their own body. Now when you think about that you may go, oh that is the next step up. It, for you, it, you don't have to even think about it, but you don't have to think about tying your shoes either. So this is a way to expand exercises that you have, take the challenge up a knot, and stay in that practical area. Now this is a little bit of a different approach. Um, I'm going to talk about a way to use marbles that uh, probably isn't something that you're familiar with. There is a complete exercise that you can set up which is a developmental exercise as well as a practical life exercise. And what it is, is transferring marbles with your toes and then washing the marbles afterwards. Because obviously you can't have children in their little bare feet putting the, their feet on the marbles and then having somebody else put them on there. Uh, at least I would teach them that that would be something you would want to clean before the work would be ready for the next child. And it is a very important developmental skill for children to have awareness and control of their feet. Proprioception is the developmental sense of knowing where you are in space. Being able to pick marbles up with your toes and transfer them from one container to another helps with proprioception, 
helps with their awareness of where they are in space and makes it more likely that they are going to be more successful in other activities out on the playground and walking carefully through the classroom.